So we're going to continue evaluating limits. And we're going to go back to, we, we've already done them graphically uh, and we've done them numerically. So we're going to go back to um, probably a, a combination here, but we're going to focus in on graphical and we're going to focus in on a piecewise function. So, and actually graphing a function ourselves. So we're going to start with just a piecewise function, but a basic trig example. So um, you should know just, you know, sine and cosine on, on the fundamental period from zero to two pi. This should not be anything too terribly complicated, hopefully, um, for you all. So let's go ahead and take a look at, so the first part of the graph is going to be sine um, on the interval from zero to two pi. So at zero, we should know that we are, of course, at zero. And then at pi over two, we're going to be up at one. And at pi, we're going to be back down at zero. So we have, you know, our function looks something like that. And then, of course, here this whole time, we are really assuming our increments are sort of the standard increments that you would initially graph with, with your trig functions. All right, and then cosine, um, you know, cosine, we don't want to start it until we get to pi. You might think, okay, cosine starts up at one, it crosses the x-axis at pi over two, and then when you get to pi, cosine at pi is negative one. But that needs to be with an open circle because technically the point doesn't exist there. Um, where the point was defined at pi, at that kind of cutoff point, where the or equal to line was, was with the sine function. Um, so we're going to have something that's going to then, of course, um, this is where it was at its min, and then it's going to come up, and it's going to cross at 3 pi over 2, and then it's going to be back up at 1 by the time it gets to 2 pi, and there that's going to be with a nice filled-in circle because that is where it is defined. So it's real important when you're graphing your piecewise functions where they change definition, that you're paying attention to where technically that point is defined. All right, so with that, I think we can define these functions hopefully relatively quickly here. All right, so let's take a look at the limit as x approaches pi over two. So as x approaches pi over two, you know, again, we wanna look at what's happening from the left and what's happening from the right. So that is always what's implied when we're looking at the overall limit. So as I get closer and closer to pi over two from the left, and then really kind of at the same time thinking about what's happening as I'm getting closer and closer to pi over two from the right. Both of those values are closing in on the same value. The y values are getting closer and closer to one. All right, second question. Limit as x approaches pi, but just from the left. So as I get closer and closer to pi, but coming from the left, those y values are getting closer and closer to zero. So again, I don't really care if the point's there or not, it's just what I'm getting kind of infinitesimally closer to. Now, the limit as x approaches pi from the right, so as I travel along the function, getting closer and closer to pi from the right, those y values are getting closer and closer to and approaching negative one. And then, of course, my answer for the overall limit at pi, once again, we would say that this limit does not exist because our limit as x is approaching pi from the left is not equal to the limit as x is approaching pi from the right. So if the one-sided limits are not equal, then the overall limit does not exist. So that's just kind of coming back to, I think, a pretty basic graph question, but making us do just a little bit of graphing there with that piecewise function. So we're going to look at another, you know, a couple of examples of piecewise functions, because these are things that you're going to need to be able to do. But we're starting off with some simple ones. So basic sine, basic cosine here, just a line and a parabola. So as we look at the first part of this function, so for values that are less than one, sometimes when I first teach this to my basic kind of algebra classes, I encourage them to sort of write up above which region of the graph, you know, should be displaying which part of the function. So less than one, we should be displaying the y equals negative two x plus four. Greater than one, we should be displaying the function y equals x squared plus one, 
And then what's happening right at 1 in this case, this is where the point is actually defined, which is saying that at the point 1, x equals 1, the actual y coordinate of this function is going to exist at 4. So let's graph the other two pieces of this function. So the line y equals negative 2x plus 4. So you have your y-intercept at 4. Now you can think about going down 2 and to the right 1 if you like that slope idea. But be careful because technically the point doesn't exist here. This is where it stops and the point is not defined there. So you would need an open circle. But you do want to keep showing the graph on all values less than 1. So let's work the slope backwards. Down to right 1 is the same thing as going up to left 1. So we can go up to left 1 and so on. So let's just kind of draw this line in through some of those points and kind of give it a little extension there with an arrow, just really signifying what's happening for that part of the graph. All right, let's draw the parabola. So we should know x squared plus 1, parabola shifted up 1, but we don't want to draw the whole thing. It can only be drawn for values to the right of 1. But you do always want to figure out where it is exactly at 1, but with an open circle. So kind of right where it picks up. So at 1, 1 squared plus 1 would be 2. So guess what? This parabola picks up. You see my green circle going over my blue circle? It picks up right at that exact same point, but again, technically it doesn't exist there. And then at 2, we'd have 4 plus 1 would be 5. After that, I'm going to kind of be off of my graph, so I'll try to kind of make it look somewhat parabolic, sort of curvy shaped here, but that's what we would have on the, the right branch, let's say. Okay, so there's my function. Let's go ahead and identify some limits. So the limit as x approaches 0. All right, well, again, this is the, the usual left and right to, in order to check the overall limit. So as I get closer and closer to 0 from the left, it looks like I'm approaching 4. And as I get closer and closer to 0 from the right, it looks like I'm also approaching 4. So this limit is, of course, equal to 4. All right, now where things are a little more interesting, of course, is where the function is changing definition. So like in this case, at x equals 1. So part B, limit as x approaches 1 from the left. So as I travel along this function, getting closer and closer to 1 coming from the left, those y values are getting closer and closer to 2. So I can see coming from the left, my y values, so my limit as x approaches 1 from the left is going to 2. Limit as x approaches 1 from the right, so as my x values are getting closer and closer to 1 coming from the right, those y values are also approaching 1. So the limit as x approaches 1 from the right is also approaching, not 1, sorry, is also approaching 2, excuse me. So that is also, that y value, sorry, is also approaching 2. So in this situation, we would say, because the left and right limit are equal, and they're approaching the same value, they're both approaching 2, so the overall limit is equal to 2. Even though f of 1 is equal to 4, we don't care about that. The limit is about what the uh, x values are getting infinitesimally closer to from both sides. And again, think about what I said in the first video. If your fingers get so close, you can almost get that electric shock. Like coming from both sides, they don't have to touch, but you can get infinitesimally close to one another. All right, um, number 11. So another graphical example, um, but let's take a look at uh, recalling just a couple of things about the absolute value function. This is a function that you're going to kind of see throughout the semester. And you may be in your mind, you think to yourself, well, I know quite a bit about the you know absolute value. I take the positive. Um, I know its graph is V-shaped. And so you probably think you got a pretty firm understanding. Those are, you know, true, you know, in, in, in essence. Um, but there's a couple other things we want to think about and read member or maybe think about a little bit differently than you have before in terms of an absolute value function. So an absolute value function is really a piecewise function. 
meaning if the number inside the absolute value bars is itself, if that number is itself positive or equal to zero, then the absolute value, which by definition is the distance to zero, um, but you kind of know if what's on the inside, you're kind of taking the positive is kind of what a lot of students are thinking. It's technically distance to zero. Um, but if the number on the inside is already positive or zero, we just take that number. So it's just x. Um, but if the number on the inside is negative, so if the x value is negative, we need to take the opposite of that negative in order to get back to a positive result. So this is how we really want to think about defining a piecewise function definition for the absolute value function. So this is going to be useful at many, many different times. So now what I want you to think about here is we're talking about the absolute value of x divided by x. So let's think about if I was to take that function that we have right there, and if I was to, even though I have kind of like two different um, pieces of the right-hand side, it is inequality, but think about dividing both sides by x here. So that kind of looks a little bit weird, I know, but let's divide both sides by x. So what this is going to now give me here Okay, so this is now going to give me, on the left-hand side, I now have this function absolute value of x over x, right? And that's what this function's all about. So if I divided everything through by x, so what I would have in that first term is you would have had the x that was there, and then you would have divided it by x, and so essentially every place where there is an x um, on the right hand side, we're dividing both sides by x there. So that x over x, of course, is just going to become 1. And then same thing here, if I had this negative x that was there, and now if I divide both sides by x on that, so we can kind of see here what we're really going to get. So that's sort of the work, I guess you could say. Um, so what are we really going to get here? We're going to have that f of x, which is this absolute value of x over x, is going to be 1. And this again, this was for values of x greater than, now it used to be greater than or equal to 0. Um, but I need to be careful because when I divide by x, division by 0 isn't defined. So I can't include the or equal to part of my definitions anymore. So this is just going to be strictly if x is um, greater than 0, and then also, of course, if x is less than 0. So here is my new piecewise definition. Now, I know you may be sitting there thinking, well, I could have just subbed this into my calculator and looked at the graph. Um, yeah, I'm sure you know that you probably could have. But a lot of these concepts that we're taking the time to develop here are important both here, you know, now and, and also later and for just, you know, lots of other just important mathematical thoughts. So you don't want to find yourself just constantly um, ignoring things that, that I'm maybe I'm talking about or that you're seeing in homework and thinking, well, yeah, but I could just graph it. There's reasons we want you to think about things, these things. So graphing calculators are great, um, but we want to be thinking through a lot of things as well. All right, so here's this function. It's a pretty straightforward function. It's 1 if x is greater than 0. So let's say I'm up here at 1, but it's strictly for values that are greater than 0. So I'm going to have to use an open circle. And then it's equal to negative 1 for values of x that are less than 0. Okay, so these two pieces put together, that is my graph for f of x. All right, so let's just talk about these limits. So as I get, again, closer and closer to zero from the left, that's the first question. That limit is getting closer and closer to, in fact, all the values happen in this case to be equal to negative one. And then as I think about my um, limit as x's are getting closer and closer to zero coming from the right, 
all of those y values are getting closer and closer. In fact, they are all equal to, in this case, 1. Again, now my overall limit, once again, as we've seen several times, this overall limit we would say does not exist, again, because our limit as x approaches 0 from the left is not equal to the limit as x approaches 0 from the right. So when those two one-sided limits are not equal to each other, then our overall limit does not exist. All right, so let's take maybe a look at just one last example here. So no new concepts in this video, but looking at piecewise functions, and I'll be honest, piecewise functions are often a, a sticking point for a lot of students. The last one, though, I really want is just to look at our graphing calculator, and then um, we'll determine the limit with that. So uh, I've already taken the liberty. I've entered this into my calculator, cosine of 1 over x, and we're going to look at the limit as x approaches 0 here. So as we look at our look at my calculator here, I've already entered in the cosine of 1 over x. And so most time with trig functions, we go into zoom number 7, zoom trig. So this is kind of interesting. I'm supposed to be thinking about what's happening as I get closer and closer to 0. And I it looks like I can't really tell. Like maybe it's going to 0, but I see this very erratic um, bouncing of values between positive and negative. It looks like the most they go to is 1 and negative 1, but a lot of bouncing back and forth. Maybe we investigate the table. So remember your table set is second window, and we're interested in what's happening around 0. So I'll start my table at 0. I'll do my change in 0 as 1,000, so 0 0.001. And let's take a look at, so I'll go seconds graph, which is table, and I can kind of up and down arrow here to kind of take a look at um, what's happening as I'm getting closer and closer to zero. So as we kind of look at these values, these really small values from the left, those are bouncing around here. And then as I'm getting from the right, um, looking, you're focusing on the y values, by the way. You can see them going back and forth between positives and negatives and zero. Now, this value right here, that just so you know, that negative three seems weird. Um, if you look down at the bottom, it says e negative 18. That's like times 10 to the negative 18th. So, you know, extremely um, very small value there. So, um, that's not actually negative three. But I can see the bouncing back and forth of the positives and negatives. Um, maybe if I just change the table to 0.01, I'm curious, let's go back to the table. Yeah, it still does that. Um, I don't think your graphing calculators, for some reason, this app isn't actually putting zero in there. It's just giving me this infinitesimally small value. Let's go back to the graph. I'm going to do second trace, which is the calculate menu. And I'm going to calculate the value, which is number one. I'm going to calculate the value at x equals 0. So I'm typing in 0, and I'm hitting Enter. And my app did not just give me the value here. But the reason for that is because it doesn't exist. So there, and you have 1 divided by 0 in that cosine function. Let's take a look at the function. So division by 0 we know is undefined. So looking back at the graph, there's this oscillating behavior. Maybe if we zoom in one more time on the graph here, um, or if I change my window, so maybe I'll go from my um, x's instead of going from, that was like negative 2 pi, um, maybe I just go from like negative um, pi over 2 to maybe just pi over 2, oops, clear, uh, pi over 2 on those values, and my y's, I don't need all the way up there, maybe just from negative 1 to 1 or something here. And let's hit the graph. So we're starting to see more of that kind of really strange oscillating in between positives and negatives and um, bouncing back and forth. So because of this really, I guess I'll call it erratic behavior, that's just kind of a new type of example. The y values, as we get closer and closer to 0, they just keep kind of bouncing all over the place between positives and negatives. They are not closing in on or getting closer and closer to um, a single value there. So that's going to be an example based on our graph here.
this is going to be an example where this limit does not exist. All right, so next time I'll maybe come back and do just a couple, like maybe one more example or so from, from the homework or something just to wrap up this section.